newly created Florida Office of Broadband. Um, DEO is very interested in getting your input and your feedback. So we would encourage all of our leaders and our partners to offer comment, questions, throughout um, at the opportunities that DEO is going to give you. Also, please go ahead and type your questions and comments into the chat box if, um, if something occurs to you and you don't have an opportunity to speak up at that particular moment. We may encourage you throughout to go ahead and comment because we know a lot of you have some very valuable experiences to share and some information on needs to share. So thank you on behalf of DEO for joining us and we appreciate a we appreciate your time and we look forward to um, a lively and very productive conversation so that DEO can go ahead and incorporate your input. And with that, I think Katie is on now. So good morning, Katie. I'm going to go ahead and hand it over to Katie. Hi, thank you. I am so sorry. You know, it would, the irony is not lost on me here that um, I am having trouble here with on a broadband and internet discussion and that I cannot log in. So um, I apologize so uh, profusely. Um, so, hi, welcome everyone. Thank you so much for that wonderful introduction and, um, and thank you for your patience while I try to, um, while I tried to get in. I know that Sean is, um, trying to get in as well so that we can have him participate. So, hi. Okay, Woo. let's get started. So, our, um, our Office of Broadband, you know, we are, we are working very diligently and we really appreciate you, um, your time today and we appreciate you participating today. These workshops are being hosted as I'm sure she has already said and I, I thank you so much for that. Um, as it's been said that we are hosting these um, by the Department of Economic Opportunity in partnership with the Florida Regional Planning Councils. And my name is Katie Smith. I'm the director for the Office of Community Partnerships in the Florida Office of Broadband here at DEO. I am your host today along with my colleague, Sean Lewis, who is a community program manager uh, with the Office of Community uh, Partnerships at DEO. I wanna thank our partners and friends at the Central Florida Regional Planning Council for facilitating our workshop today and assisting us um, in all of the technology because clearly we needed a little bit of assistance today. And I also want to thank them for collecting all of the information and the comments that are gathered here uh, so that we can expand that conversation and continue on with learning more about your region. I have been with DEO for the last six years and I've worked in business development uh, with large companies and expand, that are expanding their business to Florida and I've done economic development assisting small and rural communities. And I began the Office of Broadband and established that a little less than a year ago. Today we're going to discuss broadband and focus our conversation on accessibility, what the current status of broadband internet is in your region, and specifically for your industry sector and how you define broadband expansion. You're identified as a leader for your sector in your community and I'm looking forward to hearing your comments. Next slide, please. So during the 2020 legislative session, House Bill 969 established the Office of Broadband at DEO to increase availability and effectiveness of broadband internet throughout the state especially in small and rural communities. That's not to say that it's not necessary to expand in urban communities as well, but we are looking to um, at the small and rural communities specifically um, for certain cases. The bill also authorized DEO to access federal grant dollars to assist communities with expansion of broadband services. And the office is currently staffed by existing community partnership staff at DEO. The Office of Broadband has been really fortunate to have support and commitment of fantastic partners around the state, such as the Florida Regional Planning Councils, the Regional Councils Association, the Association of Counties, Small Counties Coalition, Florida Internet and Television, and the Department of Transportation, Education, Health, and so many others. Next slide, please. 
per section 364.0315 Florida statutes, the office has been provided four main directives, and these include the four that you see here on your screen. Create the strategic plan, build and facilitate local technology planning teams, and that specifically is what we're doing here today. Those, uh, this is beginning that, the workshops. Encourage the public use of internet service through broadband grant programs and monitor, participate in, and provide feedback for our FCC proceedings. Next slide, please. So let's kind of break that down a little bit. That strategic plan, our, it's a phased approach that we're taking for this particular directive. The, we're gonna start at a phase one, which is a feasibility study. And ideally, this feasibility study would help us identify the nature of the connectivity gap around the state, why it exists. And to help us with that, we submitted uh, last year, I believe in June, we submitted an application to the Department of Commerce and Economic Development Administration with a request for $3 million to fund the study. Unfortunately, we did not receive the funds, but we have had significant help from our partners where we, they have assisted us in asking for plans and studies and projects that are being completed in your region so that we have a better idea on a community level how to assist you in identifying that current status of broadband. All the information that we gather from that study will assist us in the creation of the strategic plan, which is phase two. So phase two we have begun an outline for the plan and we're looking forward to aggregating all of the information that we receive from these workshops and from our communities to put that into this plan so that we really can identify what what's necessary and what our next steps need to be as an office we've asked for 13 different industry sectors to join us today and so that's really um it's really vital that we hear from you and the third phase of that first directive is the implementation of those initiatives. And we're looking um, continuously at different resources to help us get to, to that implementation phase. Next slide, please. The Office of Broadband created a website. Uh, hopefully all of you have been to it. We house federal and state funding opportunities for broadband. We regularly update the site and include information on the workshops, and actually, as of last night, the survey link for public input on broadband expansion. The questions in, in, the, in the polling uh, software that we are going to work on and talk about today are going to be those same questions modified a little bit specifically for public input. So ours are more of an industry focus today, but that survey is out there and we encourage all of you to you know, go to that website and encourage um, your your constituents to to take a look at the survey and complete it that survey will be up on our website through march 1st i believe and if we if we need to extend it we can always do so one recent development you may have heard about from the scc is the rural digital opportunity fund it's rdof and that was 191 million dollars that was awarded to florida entities the fcc provided a summary of the auction by county and bidders within those counties. You can access our, the link that's on our website for more information on the RDOF awards. It's important to note, however, that uh, DEO does not have a role in determining who gets what, how the funds can be utilized, or, or how those phases are approached by each awardee. Next slide, please. So to prepare for grant funding in the future, we do not currently have grant funding for the off from through the office of broadband but for the future we know that we have to look at certain priorities that each project will have to identify in their proposals they'll have to highlight removing barriers to entry for underserved areas they'll need to encourage local and regional investment and these projects will need to address many needs which have been exposed during the pandemic such as telehealth uh the remote working and distance learning those are the top three that we hear about but i'm pretty sure there's definitely some more and maybe that'll come up in conversation later today 
Finally, the Office of Broadband is continuously monitoring broadband development activity, and we participate in the National Association discussions on a weekly basis through our partners. Next slide, please. So one thing you'll find on our broadband map is, or on our broadband website, is a map that highlights internet speeds by census block. So the state of Florida minimum internet download speeds map is using FCC data. And since January of 2015, the FCC has defined broadband internet download speeds as 25 megabits per second, or nets 25 or greater as a download speed and an upload speed of three megabits per second. So we chose to pre uh, present the FCC data a little differently. Because our off, our, the goal of our office is to focus on the underserved and unserved, we chose to highlight the census blocks with the minimum internet download speeds. So anything that's 25.3 or less, typically those FCC maps will show if there is one entity within that census block that has 25.3 or higher, it's as served. We are taking that in the opposite direction. So if it's 25.3 or higher, that's fine but there's a lot of census blocks that are less than that. And you'll see that that's where the red and the orange come into play. We understand too that the data is changing. It is ever changing, uh, the maps are changing. And with our most recent census count, that information should definitely change as well. So we do find it really interesting. It has certainly helped our office Hopefully it will help your community and your industry sector as well. We do continuously update the information as we get it, but it's important to note that this data is for fixed internet service only, satellite and mobile data are not included, and we encourage you to check it out. Next slide, please. So today is the fifth of our fifth workshop in our series, our broadband workshop series. And it's being conducted in a conjunction in partnership with the Florida Regional Councils Association. The 10 regional planning councils throughout the state are assisting DEO by facilitating with the technology portion, which clearly theirs is working a lot better than mine today. And the workshops will all be completed by February the 12th. Workshops include these uh, different industry sectors, which you can see on your screen on this slide. We are directed in statute to include all of these industry sectors. I'm really looking forward to your conversation today. All of the information from today's will be recorded and posted to our website for uh, viewing later if you choose to go back and check out all of the awesome stuff that was talked about. And so I, because I was a little late on this, I just wanna make sure, does, have you, we discussed the polling software at this point. Yes, we've, we've gone over it. Okay, so everybody's logged on and has done their initial question? No, we haven't done the test question yet. Okay, so I will go ahead and, and uh, turn it over here to Mary Beth and, and let her walk through that initial uh, stage for us. I can't hear you, Mary Beth. I think you're muted. Mary Beth, we can't. Sorry. Thanks. There you um, go. <laughs> so if you have not already uh, joined us on Poll Everywhere through your browser or text message, now is the time. Um, information on the screen, but there's also um, the information in the chat box if you still need to refer to it, because I'm going to go ahead and change this slide over. Oh, yep. One more time, just in case. So it is goldleaf599. And we're either texting or on our browsers. And then I'm going to pull up the first question. So at this point, you should be able to vote if you like chocolate or vanilla. OK. And let's see. Chocolate has been the fan favorite so far with every workshop that we've had to this point. And I tried, Katie. I voted for vanilla. I tried. 
<laughs> Looks like we're still standing firm with chocolate. That's great. Can you confirm right, when you're looking got... for A and B answers or chocolate and vanilla typed in when you text? It, you just put in the um, B letter. So either put in A or put in B. If you are texting. Um, if you're on the browser, you just click the button. So, so far I have 38 responses and we have about 63 people on the webinar. So some people haven't participated, but hopefully we will get everybody going as we get into this next question. Okay, so I'm gonna go ahead and move forward here. Okay, so the following eight questions will help the, the direct the Office of Broadband in understanding regional availability and accessibility of broadband internet service. The questions will also assist in the design of state programs and resources for broadband adoption, deployment, expansion, and resiliency. The information shared today will be used in the development of the Florida Strategic Plan for Broadband. I'm thrilled to see that everyone is plugging in where they, what they are from. Thank you so much for being on the spot with that. It looks like we have a great mix today. Thank you so much for representing your industry. And we'll give it just a few more seconds to finish. Okay. Katie, so, can you hear me? It's Brad. Yes. Yes. Hey, um, for those of us who are driving, I'm voting for chocolate. So uh, I just wanted, wanted to let you know I'm on. <laughs> Thank you, Brad. I appreciate that. All right. So let's go ahead and move to our next polling question, which is which county or your the place of your place of business or organization is located. That helps us get a get an idea of who's represented today and, and what area of your region. I'm so sorry. Okay. Sorry, we should be back. There we go. Okay. Great. That is excellent. I appreciate all of the participation from such an array of counties. Thank you. And then finally, and I, this I is see, I'm sorry. I see a question in the chat box. What if we have campuses in more than one? I would say go ahead and vote for F other. Um, that is great I, idea. Katie, I would put the main campus location. Okay. If there is a main campus location, that's great. If if it's just spread out, then other is completely fine. And then our very last housekeeping question for this morning is the are you aware of any existing local broadband studies for your area? And this is important because we have received, the office has received a good bit of studies, but I, I'm hoping that there are more out there that maybe we don't know about, or maybe maybe you have started on, maybe your industry has been participating in, in one or approached to create one. So that's great. Okay. An A for yes or B for no. All right, so let's get started in the, the meat of the program here. The next question of the following factors, which is the most important to your community regarding broadband internet accessibility? One of the reasons we ask this is it is different for every region. And we have found that some places it's really heavily reliability. You just, they just don't have the reliability in their opinion. Um, others, it's, it's more significantly a cost factor. We understand that these are a little subjective. 
these responses, but it definitely helps us get a pulse on what the community is thinking, and especially the industries. So it looks like there, and, and what another thing that we've also heard is that there, these are all interconnected, and, and it's very true. Is there anyone who would like to speak to these um, these options or something that has been maybe plaguing their industry or has been really helpful for their industry? And we're looking for feedback specifically from the sectors like education, healthcare, commerce, agriculture, tourism. Are there any aspects that that you'd like to talk about within your sectors? Okay. Good morning. Yes. This is this is Bruce Lyon in Winter Haven. Um, you know, I think it's, it, this is a terrific question that you're asking, and I think there's a great opportunity for some for some thoughtful conversation around it. So I appreciate you probing for additional discussion. Um, for some of us, and, and I won't speak to my office in particular, but some of the businesses that I work with, it's not about cost, speed, reliability, or the provider. It's about is it available at all, right? So, so we just have these um, kind of internet deserts um, across the, the state that um, for one reason or another um, just do not have broadband in certain locations or don't have reliable broadband and, and that really if it's not reliable it doesn't count at all from from an industry perspective right and so when we work with companies that are interested in locating in the uh, areas of the heartland um, that may wor work very well because of transportation access, uh, rail, other inputs, labor, cost of land. Um, when there's no internet, it starts to complicate matters. It's not to say the companies won't locate, but it certainly um, uh, positions the heartland to be less competitive in seeking these economic development opportunities. And that, that can be a challenge. Um, when sometimes we also have challenges with you know, access to water or something like that. Um, so I, I would encourage you to, to contemplate where the, the broadband deserts are across the state, um, as well as obviously these other five factors that you already have. Okay, no, I think that's great. Thank you so much, Bruce, I appreciate that. And I think you're right on with where are the, broad, where are the broadband deserts in the state. Um, I'm hoping that through these workshops, we will be able to help fully start identifying those deserts. Also, hopefully we'll be able to get through a study and, and see on a more on a more local level where those where those those work um, this. Does anyone else have any conversation or any comments, any thoughts? Katie. Uh, can you hear me? Steve Elias here, from, also from Winter Haven. Hi, Steve. Um, good, good morning. Um, just, just a quick comment on maybe it's some overlap on some of the categories here, but another issue kind of deep, diving deeper into the speed question is is the bandwidth. Um, you know, if, if you're just one user and you're trying to connect to the internet and do Teleeducation or medicine or whatever, and you know you you know you need a certain speed to do a Zoom call and download files or whatever. That's one thing. But if you have a business of five people, ten people, twenty people, fifty people, that are all trying to use the internet at the same time, mm -hmm. you know, and, and I'm in the engineering business, so so you know when one person tries to you know access a large file from the cloud. You know, it bogs down the whole office, and that's one person doing it, and it affects ten other people in the office. So, so bandwidth is another, you know, kind of related to speed. Another question that needs to be defined a little bit more, because uh, we get, you know, you look at that twenty-five-three outdated FCC definition of broadband. You know, that doesn't meet modern-day business needs, and certainly going forward, if you're looking forward, what well, we need five years from now. So. I, I would encourage you to 
maybe look at the bandwidth in total when it comes to businesses or or any operation of school or whatever. I That's think that's a fantastic point. Thank you so much. And and you're actually one of the first ones to point that out very specifically during the discussion portion. So thank you for for mentioning that. Um, is there any comment from any of our anyone else on? That? Yes, Katie. This, this is. Um, go ahead. Whoever was speaking. This is this is Megan DiGiacomo from Highlands County Economic Development. Um, I really resonated with what Bruce was saying, the accessibility, um, but even just as recently as yesterday, we have an access issue, but we also have a speed issue here. So we have been fostering relationships with businesses that are looking to come in and do brick and mortar locations here, but also through those um, relationships, we have people that are doing a lot more remote work. And so for like things like call centers, that can be anywhere these days. We have someone that wants to come in and have the opportunity to hire 300 people in Highlands County to do remote work. Um, but the issue that they're facing right now is that we don't have high enough speed to hit their parameters. Um, and so that could be a really great opportunity for a community like Highlands in opening jobs to people that might be out of work right now and would like that remote option, but they just don't have the internet speed to make that feasible. And I think that with how, what we're seeing with COVID, that remote work might be more um, permanent than we think. And so being able to provide those opportunities to our community members and our workforce is really important as well. Excellent point. Nick, did you have another comment for us? Yes, this is Nick Nicholas from Lakeland, Florida. Um, hello, everyone. Um, mine is just more probably a comment uh, than uh, maybe making a specific point, but I, I understand why you wanted us to pick just one, but in my business experience and actually personal experience, cost, speed, and reliability go hand in hand. I mean, really the technology and the provider is really a secondary thought. And, and why I say that is even when some places have decent speed or good speed, if it's not reliable, you can't depend on it. And if, if it's, it doesn't even have to be for business reasons. It can be for educational or health or other you know, re reasons why somebody would need that. If you don't have that, you, you know, you can't operate very well, so you become very unproductive. And it does need to be affordable because there are some places, if you're willing to pay for it, you may be able to get the speed, the bandwidth, and maybe better reliability, but you, you need all three, and all COVID did is really highlight to our community, and hopefully that will help us gain some better support, that this is an issue, and uh, it's not we can't go backwards at this point. Uh, people are using technology in ways they haven't before. So I just think w we need to keep in mind that all three are important, um, and basically are needed. Mm -hmm. And Nick, I, I completely agree with you. There is definitely, we are seeing that same comment repeated in all of our workshops, that they do go hand in hand. It's not necessarily just one. And and while we do ask for just just one, I think it just helps us identify what the pulse of that community is, but you are definitely giving us more to think about and how to approach it with with what those needs are. So this is this is excellent. Is there any anyone else? I know that here in the chats we're seeing um, a lot of agreement on the, the broadband deserts and and there being a consistency with speed, cost, and reliability all being in that same the same issue. Um, Katie, this, this is Nick. Um, go ahead. Whoever's going to speak. Hey, Katie, Katie it's uh, Brad. I just wanted to say on a, a previous call that was facilitated by FPOT, um, Winter Haven has some, some uh, pretty good um, programs where when they open up trenches for providers to, to co trench, you know, that take one mentality. I know we've talked about it on a previous call, but, uh, but Winter Haven has that uh, that uh, cohesiveness, I guess uh, you, you could say, with providers that let everybody know when they're going to open up uh, dirt, so that um, so that everybody can can you know 
avoid, you know, multiple spend uh, trenching. So, um, you know, that's one of those obstacles to deployment that, um, you know, in our principles is greater coordination between um, your, your, your city and your, your, your um, infrastructure um, deployment agencies, if you will, with your private sector providers. So um, that, that's another one. Thank you, Brad. Nick, what else were you going to comment on? Um, thank you, Katie. Um, it, it's it's really something that being involved with um, smart communities and po uh, for Polk Vision, um, we run up against a lot. At least from my viewpoint of you know being part of that that conversation, is that we have this catch twenty two. Is that we're we're in an area, and I think all of us on this call are, would be included in that area. That isn't necessarily considered. Uh, you know, a prime area for investment in terms of that infrastructure to give us the cost, speed, and reliability. But at the same time, if we don't have that investment, we can't get achieve what we need to. So I think when we're looking at this, especially from a statewide standpoint, there are some areas, and probably you can do by the regional planning where they're located at, uh, that really part of the problem is if there can be a help with an, an investment because if it's not making sense for a company to invest in infrastructure that could provide it um, and that it could be very valid business reasons why it doesn't work for them uh, we as a constituents in that area aren't um, aren't getting the benefit that we need and we're falling further behind um, so I just I, I just think the investment um, is a very important thing to look at Thank you, Nick. I appreciate that. That's 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 great. Any anyone Katie, else? Katie, can I add yeah. one more? Brad. I'll let Brad go, and then we'll then we'll cut back to Stephen, and then we'll go to the next caller. Yes. I was just going to add that um, those federal dollars that we've discussed on other uh, other calls that the FCC is releasing. You know, we've heard of the RDOF dollars. We've heard of um, another uh, three billion um, that the FCC is going to release. Those dollars and having Florida and obviously DEO and the work that you're doing in a position to capture those dollars can really change that that investment calculus, if you will, for the private sector. When you talk about, you know subsidizing, you know, the, 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 the cost of sediments, if you will, to deploy. So I think, um, I think, you know, the Fed just approved the uh, next hundred million dollars that for the FCC to begin mapping, you know, they spent the last two years figuring out how to map more granularly than the census block methodology. Now they're going to be mapping and so identifying both the desert and then you know, capitalizing on some of that money that's going to let be let by the Fed for uh, some of these local opportunities. Um, you know, I know my members uh, just announced a three billion dollar commitment to the United States uh, charter did uh, for rural um, investment, and then Comcast likewise uh, just up their speed of their low cost internet program. So you're, you're seeing a lot of this federal uh, momentum carry over into the private sector, and, uh, and I think. You know, to the points that were made by the city um, on deployment, chasing those deserts, changing that investment calculus uh, will play a big role in future deployment. Thank you, Brad. Other comments? Hi, Katie, have? it's oh, great. Katie, this is Stacy Briggs with T Mobile. Um, how are you? I'm glad to be joining Hi. today. We, I just wanted to mentioned that uh, you know, T-Mobile recently merged with Sprint and um, with that we are going to have um, some bandwidth capabilities that, that we think will rival uh, you know, the speeds that you get from fiber. Uh, our network is built with a fiber backbone to the towers, um, but we are recently purchased 600 megahertz spectrum from the FCC that will allow us to reach, um, you know, like broadcast spectrum, 600 megahertz broadcast spectrum into rural areas with some real depth on 5G. And for me, the way I like to think of 5G is really just the next generation, the, the, the next speed that we're going to get to. But it also does have capacity. 
So um, we're building out that network really as a condition of our merger. Uh, we're required to do it. The FCC and the Department of Justice, very strict um, uh, requirements there. But we will be building out that network um, th throughout this region and um, you know, happy to get more information to folks as we do that. But that I think uh, you know, it's not just the, the uh, wired industry stepping up. We've got wireless competition and we're bringing that uh, throughout the region. Thank you, Stacy. Sure. Katie, can I sneak in one more comment? Sure, please do. Hey, K say Katie. Um, just one other little factor related, you know, looking at the title of the slide broadband um, and we talked about the 25 three download upload uh, definition mm -hmm. that's really quite outdated. Um, mm -hmm. As part of some recent survey work, just reaching out to different industries, we'll say, you know, whether it's hospitals or public safety or, you know, different community needs that are out there. It's mm -hmm. interesting, you know, we're, we're stuck kind of typically looking back at this really old definition, 25.3, but now with video calls and the cloud and all this sort of stuff, upload speeds are maybe just as important as download now or, or going forward. And it's interesting, you know, as we talk about this, if you really, you know, just caution looking at today's needs versus what you may need in five years or 10 years, because it kind of opened our eyes as part of some survey work looking forward. You know, if hospitals are saying, for example, that, you know, today they need gigabit and, and 10 years from now they need 10 gigabit, you know, as we're moving forward with broadband initiatives, we really need to be considering, you know, not what yesterday's needs are, because, you know, because a year ago, we would have never imagined we'd be doing video calls today. And, and here we are, and now that's, now try to download files and do a live video presentation and see what happens, you know. So, so um, anyway, just caution, what, when you're defining broadband, you know, keep that in mind. It's really the weakest link in the chain really is the most important. So if you look around the community and a single user in a home with one child may only need, maybe 25.3 is good, I don't know. But if the hospital needs 10 gigabit, you know, you need to think of how you're building out the community to, you know, meet the, you know, the, the critical, critical link in the chain, I guess. I hear you there and I, I, I understand what you're saying and that's, that's definitely part of the discussion is what to look for what's in going to be needed in the future. We do need to start with where we are and what we've got currently, but definitely looking for the future. That is that is really, I feel like, part of our main purpose for the Office of Broadband is to, to help define what that looks like. Seeing what other states have done has been really interesting. Um, I don't know if if any of you have have looked at some of the other some of the other states and and what they are working towards, but it it's, it is really interesting in what they're how they are defining speeds or access. And um, Florida has a lot has has room to grow. So is is there anyone else on this particular question that we want, maybe wants to speak up? Hey, Katie. Yes, Katie. Hallie Owens and Obi. Go ahead. Hello. Um, so what I, I'm wondering is on these questions and this one in particular with the result, first of all, are you seeing overwhelming um, response being that reliability is the big one that people are choosing? Because I, I think you've done this, you said five times now. So is that is that consistently the one that people are choosing as being most important? It is one of the most popular. Okay, and uh, and I'm my assumption is then it, the conversations take the same turn when that is discussed. So in getting this information, what is what is going to be the use for this? Is this what you're going to use to to put together a strategic plan, or is there some other purpose in? getting this information and gathering it? Sure, so uh, the information that's gathered here from these questions and from the survey link on our website will be 
included as part of our strategic plan. So it's going to help guide what our strategic plan looks like, and it will help us in provide guidance for grant possible grant programs in the future. Okay, so and then to tag on to the end of that, I would say that is there going to be um, a a follow up survey um, because. If you get through this and you find that reliability is the big one, but it means so many different things and involves so many different parameters, and you're wanting to use that information for a strategic plan, it might be of good use to do a, a some sort of follow-up survey that's going to drill down a little bit more. So that's going to help with the objectives um, set forth out of the strategic plan. I do agree with you. And I just think we're not quite there yet, but I think that we will absolutely have to reach out uh, and, and look at and do a deep dive into some of these other factors. For today's purposes and right now, we are definitely keeping it very high level and we recognize that. But we, we wanna try to figure out where the conversation needs to go for accessibility and um, for that expansion piece because accessibility to me when we talk about that at a high level that's three different pieces are you talking about making it accessible because of you just need to be able to get to the internet are you talking about speeds and the reliability of those speeds make it accessible for you or are you talking about i have those other two i just need a device to make it accessible and I think the conversation can really go and branch and branch and branch. We just have to keep it at, at a level right now where we can try to identify and, and start doing a deeper dive after we've seen what's, what's uh, stated in these workshops. But I completely agree that a follow-up, what we're seeing is, is a follow-up may be necessary. Here's a question from Winter Haven. Hi, uh, this is Hip Win with the City of Winter Haven, um, um, and I deal with the Smart City um, team, and I'm the Smart City officer for the City of Winter Haven. I think one of the issues is that we kind of tend to stay get stuck on the lower rungs of the Maslow hierarchy of broadband because of this connectivity. What it really does is not having this transformational capability inhibits innovation. It inhibits our ability to be competitive. So a lot of times when we visit places that have gigabit internet, they find that it's never enough. You know, when you go in and you fill a 10 gig pipe, you need more. And we're seeing that with uh, with uh, some of the users that we have, um, you know, the hospitals and the schools that are using our dark fiber, that is, it's, they're filling up the pipe with that connectivity. So when you say, is it 25 gigabits enough? We need the ability to do, you know, as much as we can in terms of connectivity because it's transformative in what we're able to do in terms of how we uh, provide services, provide disaster recovery, hit every sector. Um, and COVID's kind of exposed that a bit, a bit, but people only know what they know. You know, kind of that Godel theory, we only can solve problems in the box, but when you go outside the box, you're able to see, wow, there are things that we haven't even imagined yet that we're able to do with this. And sometimes when you talk about broadband, it just, reference on what people know oh faster netflix better resolution uh you know connectivity and work from home no you know what we could we could aggregate resources so much more effectively and transform how we do things um and it's it's and those are things that's really hard to connect and convey until we figure out ways to not only provide connectivity but build mechanisms for us to be able to leverage and optimize that create centers of uh, centers of excellence to kind of say you know, besides getting connectivity, this will transform health in this way. So it's more that getting above that Maslow hierarchy of broadband, I, I, I don't know if it exists, but the, the idea is that we're just stuck with surviving that we don't really think about, you know, those higher level things that we can achieve. I think that's one of the big issues that, that a lot of times our discussion is just, I just need to connect to survive, to be able to do basic things Versus, let's go in and be able to attract the best and the brightest people to be able to go in and bring the best commerce to solve the biggest problems that we have. That's what we're trying to do. 
Thank you. That is incredibly insightful, and it, and I and you're right, and that's definitely a, a strong piece of the puzzle for for expanding broadband. It's not just getting that immediate access, but but growing from an economic development level, and growing the economy, and growing industry, and growing in, on so many in so many different sectors. Um, I would like to go ahead and move forward with the next question. And I feel like we're starting to get into some of that as well. So the next question is, what type of internet technology would, are we missing one here? Um, what type of internet technology does your internet, does your industry sector currently utilize through its in, internet service provider? So that's really what I'm looking for right now is, what is that current, current technology that you're using. And one of the reasons that I ask this is to better understand what you're using now. The next question is what are you what would help you be more connected and provide more accessibility for the future. Again, this helps us understand the needs and what different industries need. Um, and how we need to grow, how we need to grow the programs, what we need to put in our, our strategic plan. So selfishly, that's what we're looking for. But I am sure we have some comments on um, on this this particular question. Katie, it's Gabe Sheehan at the College Board. Can you hear me okay? Yes, Gabe. Thank you for joining. Hey, thank you. Thanks, thanks for having me. Thank you for uh, this, this opportunity. So, so just just as real, real quickly on the College Board, um, in case folks don't know, but you're probably aware, the College Board is known for um, the the SAT and advanced placement testing. So, uh, our goal is to make sure that students have have access, um, particularly when it comes to something like uh, advanced placement. In, in this case, that I want to talk about. Um, to have access to to ensure that uh, they have an opportunity to get college credit. Most people know if you score uh, a three to five um, on an AP exam in Florida, you automatically get that college credit. So when you're doing that in high school, um, that obviously turns into a cost saving. So real quickly, just I thought it would be of interest to the group from an education perspective. I'll, I'll, I'll make a long story short, but last spring when the virus hit and, and schools were shut down, we at the College Board were obviously in a little bit of a, of a dilemma in terms of, of, of advanced placement testing which takes place in the spring. Well, long story short, we interviewed um, those students who were signed up to take AP exams and we said, guys, do you, got, do, do, do you still want to take it given the environment and the circumstances or not? Well, a, a overwhelming majority of them said, yes, please give us the chance to take an AP exam. So we quickly turned that into what used to be a, what was at that time a paper and pencil classroom experience um, into an online AP exam. Um, so, you know, there were like three, and this is, I'm, I'm talking more nationwide at this point, but, but in, Florida has a lot of AP exam takers. Um, but what happened was we were concerned, you know, with the digital divide, what, what would this mean? So we were, at, we, we partnered with some other groups and organizations. We provided, um, uh, hotspot devices as we could to students who requested them because really it seemed that the reliability um, proved to be a, a somewhat of a different you know uh, difficult problem to address so just quickly th that this was this was actual research done by the college board so I wanted just to make sure that the group was aware and I, and I think this is all just to say hey like like we're we're with you we, we are we are 100 percent behind this effort in terms of broadband access and and reliability and everything uh, else in terms of students, um, because mostly those rural students uh, are, are, are affected by that. But I want to say a couple of things. Students, this is a result of the research. Students who took AP exams last spring, um, who, who we provided devices to, earned about 5,000 scores of three or higher. So that, that translated into over $5 million in potential college savings. The AP exam participation rates in 2020 were higher among students who received uh, these devices than those who did not. That might seem obvious, but I think that that's in terms of kind of a, a reliability issue. And then students who took AP exams uh, with these devices performed um, better than those students who did not. So 
unfortunately, I have to hop off of this call pretty much right now to get on another one. Um, but, I, but again, just from the College Board perspective, from an education aspect, this stuff's very important. Um, we would love to continue the conversation, but I wanted to make sure before I got off that, that I shared that information. Thank you, Gabe. That is very interesting. And if anyone would like a copy of that uh, research, I will be happy to share that. There is some really interesting, um, it does bring to light some, di some different points, but I think it's also important for us to take that information and then relate it to those that aren't taking those AP exams as well. And, and how that, if just having that reliability, going back to our previous conversation, having that reliability uh, provides just a little bit of stability for, a little more stability, let's say, for students. Anyone else have a Hey, this? Katie, Katie, this is Brad. Uh, just to dovetail on Jade's comment, um, you know, when those, the, for some students, you know, um, the cost issue becomes an accessibility issue, can they, you know, they might have it, but they may not be able to, to, to afford the service. Um, and I know I mentioned this in other calls, but our members do offer a low cost um, internet accessibility program. I, I mentioned a little bit earlier, but for roughly $15 a month for those families that qualify for free and reduced lunch, um, those households can qualify for $15 a month uh, high speed broadband connection. So um, that's a program that, that when we think about accessibility, it's highly underutilized um, and a great opportunity for where, where, where access or availability isn't the, the problem, meaning it's not the street. Um, that's an opportunity for those households to, to go for it, not for our friends. And uh, the telecommunications space, uh, at and and um, they offer similar programs as well. So um, let's not forget that where there, where there is access, um, or, or I should say availability, um, and, and cost is the challenge, uh, both the telecom community and the broadband community is there with those types of programs. Thank you. Thank you, Brad. And if anyone's interested in some of those, those low cost um, programs, I do have a link that I'll be happy to share with all of you um, on that. So let's go to the next slide here. And the next slide talk is talking about what would technology would increase your accessibility to those that you serve. Again, this goes back to the last question was current technology. This next question is for the future and, and do, doing a little bit of forward thinking. It's interesting here in this workshop, the conversation on smart cities, we haven't had that conversation yet and discussing broadband from a smart city perspective. Uh, the last few have been definitely focused more on a, um, just a, just a different, a different conversation. What would, would anybody like to speak to what type of technology might be helpful for their industry if we haven't heard from you? Hey, Katie, uh, this is Brad one more time, just real quick. Uh, I know we have Hardy County on the line and we've talked about it literally on every other call. Um, you know, it's going to take all of the available technologies in the marketplace, not just a hardwire cable or hard fiber, um, <laughs> to reach these businesses. Um, we've set it up, we were on FDOG calls with uh, the people from Hardy County, and uh, they are using point to point wireless uh, solutions uh, to, to reach that, that, that really rural uh, marketplace. And, um, you know, and, and whether it's the new low orbiting satellite, or it's the new 5G that's coming along. Um, you know, it, it, it will take all of the technology. Florida has 95% of its citizens have access to a high-speed broadband connection. You can debate this, this is the, the, the speed, you know, till the cows come home. But for that last 4 to 5% of Florida, it, it's going to take everybody working together to, to, uh, to, reach, or to reach and make available um, to those um, uh you know, it's going to take all that technology. So um, I, I think uh, Hardy's on, but, uh, you know, I've mentioned on every other call. And uh, 
is going to take everybody. Thanks, Danny. Thanks, Brad. Anyone else have any thoughts on that? This is Bill Lambert from Hardy County, if I may make a comment. Yes, please. Our system is somewhat unique. Um, we, we built it approximately 10 years ago. We believe that it is an outstanding solution for lower density rural parts of Florida. Certainly it's not gonna be as competitive as high density urban fiber, but we have been extremely pleased with the broadband system that we have. It's essentially ubiquitous in Hardy County. Um, it expands into Polk, Manatee, uh, DeSoto and Highlands County. And I, I, I think it's worthy of the state taking a look at it. Uh, I know that Senator Ben Albritton obtained this service uh, sometime last year, and he has been absolutely astounded with it. And we would be more than happy to uh, show what we've done to anyone that would be interested, because I do think it is the, the best solution for the lower density areas of Florida. Thank you, Bill. That is excellent. I would love to hear more about it and and how you your what the successes have been, uh, how you started. So please let's share that um, maybe offline. I would love to hear about that. Certainly, and also I know that uh, Terry Burroughs down in Okeechobee County is doing a feasibility study right now. So he should have it's very soon. He'll have current cost on what the installation and it's it's pretty much high capacity 5G type equipment. So we'll, I'll leave it at that. That is great, thank you. Anyone else? Okay, Sean, do you have any thoughts on this? Any comments? This Katie? question is always very interesting to me because it can be answered um, two different ways. Um, what's your fairy wish <laughs> and what is your wish within um, the reasonable financial and fiscal constraints of your area? Um, so, so I'm always kind of interested in, in which approach people took when they answered this question. Can anyone speak to that? This is Megan from Highlands County. Um, we were kind of having an, an offline conversation about that too, of, of how you go about addressing this question and how you answer. Mm -hmm. um, for some of it is, for some of us, do we fully even understand the nitty gritty of broadband and what that includes and what these different types of services are and their benefits. Um, and so I think that the kind of the hot ticket word you hear a lot is fiber, right? And so right. Right. some of us naturally maybe went to fiber because that's what we know. Um, mm -hmm. Are these other solutions something that might make more sense? And like you said, more feasible? Possibly. So mm -hmm. some of it too, some of these responses you might be getting from our community and throughout these regions are based on you know, people like me that don't necessarily speak the lingo and know all that goes into it. Um, but I think what you said is exactly right. Would we all maybe like the fairy wish fiber and think that's the best solution? Yes, is that actually what's gonna be the best solution for all of us in a feasibility capacity? I'm not sure. And not so I would hope that some of this too leans on some expertise that the state has or partners or whatever, so that we truly get something in a strategic plan that's, that's feasible and makes sense. Um, if that is, makes sense. Just yeah, it absolutely does. Um, it absolutely does. Thanks, Megan. I appreciate you speaking up to that because I think you're right. I mean, and I can say with all honesty, I did not um, speak the lingo and I don't think I do still. There's a lot that I don't, uh, that, I, that I can't explain uh, properly and, and fluently, but I think you're right that, you know, the first thing people say, oh, yes, let's do, let's have fiber. Well, maybe that's, maybe that's the way to go. And maybe it's 
part of the way to go with other technologies. Maybe it's having more hotspots that are available and accessible. Maybe it's utilizing satellites. I, I don't know what that looks like. So we have to we have to kind of go in this together and, and see um, what what else we can do. Um, and I see there's a chat, there's a question in the chat box. So I'm going to go to that in just a minute. But I think um, Hep, did you have a question or comment? Um, yes, I guess it's, I, was, I was reading um, Commissioner Madden's, uh, but it's it's fiber because of the capacity and the security uh, of it. Uh, a lot of these technologies, the wireless is simply an extension of the fiber footprint where it's uh, you know it might be cost prohibitive. Yeah, when, but what we've done, you know, when we when we first started, before we put in fiber, it, you know, fiber is very expensive to put in in terms of a lot of the cost is putting in the ground. But what we've done is we leverage what we're currently doing. Are we doing a transportation project? Are we doing a recreation project? Are we doing a utilities project? And when you're doing it as part of those projects, your your cost is pennies on the dollar. So the problem with people saying fiber is it's so expensive. But if we really say, let's work together, what are we currently doing? I'm pretty sure there is a, a utility project or a transportation project that's going on. And we say, hey, if we could simply design and put in conduit as part of that, it's this transformative, transformative technology will pay for itself many times over. And that's what's happened in Winter Haven. We have 50 miles of fiber that we put in over 17 years, one conduit, one conduit at a time of these projects. It, it was crazy when we started. But as we connect it and connect and combine it together, it's provided resiliency, connectivity. It's helping us be able to sell our city from an economic development standpoint. So you got to go and you know as Green, you know Green Wetzky uh, said, you got to skate to where the puck's going to be, not where it is. I think sometimes the conversation is, let's figure out what we do to solve now. Look at you know the wireless technology moves so fast. But fiber is that core backbone that makes all these other technologies make, make it a little easier. So I always see that uh, the cellular technology is simply an extension of that fiber footprint that we have. Thank you. And T-Mobile would agree. <laughs> T-Mobile would yeah. agree with that for sure. <laughs> and I don't want to mention um, our hotspot. Hotspots have been, uh, you know, all the rage uh, right now for distance learning and, you know, they're, they're very hardy. We have a hotspot program. We also have hotspot checkout programs for libraries. But then also, um, we're working with uh, the cable providers and others to to get you know remote spots put up as necessary. Whether those are routers and buses, or you know temporary solutions to bring you know bandwidth into certain community. We know those are kind of band aids, but uh, we've all been very creative getting out in these communities and. Um, hotspots just add capacity. Uh, you can get unlimited hotspot. We actually have a, a, a free 10, 10 gig uh, a month hotspot for students on low income students. But, uh, you know, the unlimited products are very affordable for all of us. So I think uh, it's it is definitely an option for um, in home use right now to add capacity. Well, and I think that this brings up a good point. It has to be a two prong approach. We have to have the short term so that we can get everyone what they need and we have to have whatever that long term approach is. And and it's going to it's going to take a it takes a village, right? It takes it takes everybody and their input and clearly the conversation today has been fantastic. And I think that there is a lot more conversation to be had on on where that short-term uh, accessibility lies and where that long-term accessibility lies. I want to go back just, um, just a minute and maybe Mr. Lambert can answer this or maybe there's someone in Hardy County. Uh, someone, Mark asked what kind of speeds is Hardy County achieving with their, um, it, you, with their success that they've had? This is Bill. I'd, I'd like to defer to Dustin German if he's still on the phone. Dustin, are you there? Hello, you're muted if you're trying to talk. He's showing and still being on the call. 
Well, in any event, I can I can address it. Our base service is 25 by three or 25 by five. I'm not sure. I'm somewhat confused sometimes because I, I go to my children's house in Bradenton or Naples and they tell me they've got 100 or 500 megabits of service and I'm trying to watch Netflix and they're buffering. And I'm watching Netflix on our system with two or two computers, a couple of smart TVs, smartphones, and I'm not buffering at 25 by five. So somewhere we need to get some nomenclature corrected in the industry. Um, I, I, I believe that bandwidth and speed are pretty much exactly the same thing. There was some conversation about that earlier. And I also think it's important to note that we've not mentioned middle mile and last mile, but you can have a fantastic last mile fiber system, but if it's not sufficiently connected to the middle mile, which gets it to the data centers in Orlando, Tampa, Miami, or Jacksonville, or Winter Haven, then you're going to have latency problems. So there's, there's multiple tiers of engineering concerns that have to be dealt with when you're building a system. And I, I hope at some point we will get a common nomenclature when we talk about speeds and, and I think Dustin is now on, so I'll hush and Dustin, you can address it and correct anything I misstated. Thank you. Um, the question was about what, what speeds that we're seeing in Hardy County? Yes. 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 Um, on the on the five G systems, we're seeing a hundred, or we're providing up to a hundred megabits uh, to the home or business on the five G. Okay. Great. That's fantastic. Thank you. Yes. Um, and then there was another comment here, Stephanie Madden. When 5G is deployed, how has the community response been? As a city commissioner, we're often hit with barriers with citizens not wanting the cell tower, whether for aesthetic reasons or safety concerns. And and I I understand that. I'm I might have to defer to Brad on this one. I'm not sure what the alternative may be for that. I'm not sure if Fred's muted or not, if he's still on with us. JD and Brad, sorry, I was on mute. Um, uh, could you re ask that question, please? Sure. So, uh, one of the city commissioners, or I'm, yes, the city commissioner that's on our call with us was asking about how to, how do we get, a, what's the community's response then? Because what they have noticed is they hit barriers with citizens not wanting a cell tower or because of aesthetic reasons or safety concerns with required antennas closer to homes and schools, et cetera. So I don't know if the industry has a some kind of. Yeah, it, 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 it's a tough one because typically it's that conversation comes up. Um, hopefully I'm not getting any feedback. Give me a plan. Um, the industry you know, typically have those conversations as it relates to Wi-Fi and, and Wi-Fi hotspots. Um, our, my friends in the wireless world that are on the call um, definitely deal with 5G um, and more than, you know, they, they're the ones that are actually dealing with the, the permitting challenges on 5G towers. But unfortunately, they do have to be above ground because 5G does not work underground. And uh, so any of the um, ATT or um, uh, Lumen folks are on, they can probably speak to that better. Do we have anyone from Lumen? Hey, Katie, it's Christy Mason. Um, I can't really speak to 5G. Um, I can only recite some of the things that I've heard AT&T discuss regarding permitting issues and placing towers. I don't know if, um, Matt Mucci, you are still on? I, I, I could talk a minute on it. I do know, I don't know of any specific issues in Florida right now or in this region. However, um, the AT&T and Verizon are deploying 5G small cell technology pretty rapidly everywhere, and that does require some extra permitting. We have a really great law in um, that we worked, you know, with everybody, cable industry and local governments to get accomplished uh, a couple of years 
years ago. So we have a streamlined process in Florida. The big issue is just making sure everybody follows that. Um, for for T-Mobile, our 5G is actually uh, uh, also mid-band spectrum and that low-band spectrum. So we have a, a layer cake approach, but uh, we could get into more of that. But that's generally, it, it, yes, can be an issue, but um, we do have laws on the books that I, I think are beneficial. Yeah, and just to, just to follow that up uh, from an at and perspective, uh, we are currently deploying much the same way as T-Mobile is with our small cells antennas and, and poles in a concentrated downtown area. Not so much, or not at all actually yet in Lakeland, sorry Commissioner Madden. Uh, but then yeah, of course the other way is to go through our macro towers. And so yes, that is the concern. I, I understand uh, the not in my backyard concern as well as the safety concern. I think the safety concerns you'll never change some people's minds about that. Show them all the data saying that that's not a concern, but uh, you know, there are always going to be those conspiracy theorists out there that are going to believe it. So it is tough, but like I said, there is kind of a two pronged approach to it with the macro towers and the small cell antennas. So we're getting there. Um, in Trump County, you know, there is 5G available through the macro towers as well as. Uh, DeSoto County and Hardy County. So it's it's there and it's it's only going to grow as, as time goes on. Thank you so much, Matt. I appreciate, and Stacy. I appreciate both of you chiming in on that. I Before we leave this question, I, I see that um, Stephen Elias has a quick comment. I'm sorry that we didn't get to you sooner. No, no problem. I just kind of building on what everybody's sort of saying here. Yeah. Talking about the technology, it's, somebody made the comment that it's really not one size fits all. Um, mm -hmm. You know, it's really part. You know, it's part answered by the density of the area you're trying to serve and and cost effectiveness um, realities. You know, you can't. It's not going to be cost effective to run fiber lines down every street, down every you know, throughout a 2,000 square mile county like Polk County. Um, and, and also what are, it leads to another conversation is what are your smart cities, people have mentioned smart cities, what are your smart city outcomes that you're trying to achieve? Because just maybe some extreme examples, but if you're just trying to, again, you know, do tele-education on an iPad for one student, um, you know, maybe in a rural area, maybe satellite works because, you know, as long as you can connect and even if there's a little bit of buffering, you're okay. But the other extreme of that might be, you know, from a smart city outcome standpoint, what if you had a corridor, a very congested traffic, heavily, you know, a high transportation corridor, and you're trying to accomplish connected vehicles, where vehicles are trying to connect to the traffic light, talking to other vehicles, and then back, and, and you know, and, and now you have a connected vehicle and decisions, you know, somebody else is driving your car, latency becomes an issue. You can't be connecting to a satellite that, oh, there's a three second buffer, you know, cars will crash. Um, so so it's really, you know, part dependent on what your smart city outcomes are. And if you haven't had that conversation, you don't, you haven't answered that question. Thank you. That's bring up some very, very good points. Before we move on to the last question here, is there anyone else who would like to speak to this? Sean. Just a real quick question. With the, with the benefit of the context of all that conversation, just out of curiosity, by a show of hands, with that context, would any of you have changed your answer to this question? Okay, great. Thank you. All right, so let's move on to the next question. And we're almost done here. This is the second to last question. And please identify the greatest challenge or barrier concerning broadband internet faced by your community or region. And this one has been another one that kind of goes back to a, a previous question. It's multi-layered. There's one that you could focus on or just maybe put a finger on that would be great. Looks like it's overwhelming so far with the poll responses coming in.
All right, so it looks like lack of internet service providers or limited options is overwhelmingly what looks to be the greatest barrier for this region. Anybody want to speak to that, or do we feel like we've covered some of that? I feel like we have some, some itching to, to make a comment. Katie, this is Bruce Lyon again in uh, Winter Haven. Hi. Hey. So it, it's interesting, 72% so far, right, agree. It's it's lack of internet service providers or limited options. And, and I would say from a, a slightly higher level, just working closely with city and county government and the Regional Planning Council on this, it's, it's, it's the lack of providers, but it's also the, um, I think, the competition um rightly so the competition from the existing providers um when they see um grassroots movements or government movements or local efforts that could potentially uh, infringe on their uh, market and so there, there's always this kind of uh, push pull in these conversations about well the, the community needs to do x for the good of the community but there's always this anticipation that one of the the providers will push back um, at a political level to try to retain their um, their their um, market position. And that's perfectly fine and understandable. Um, but at some point, this really does have to, I think, resonate that the good of the community, the growth of the state is more important than the territory of a single provider. And that may be a conversation that your office can now start to um, perpetuate at a, at a higher level than those of us who deal with this uh, locally. And, and that's not to say that any of the, the com competitive discussions have been um, particularly negative. They've been fruitful. They've, they've been uh, productive conversations at times. But there's this kind of overarching concern whether, whenever the topic comes up that some, some provider is going to push back at the, the, the political levels that, that they have access to to cause a challenge. And so, um, that's just a challenge that I think will need to be overcome going forward, um, where we can find ways to work in, in a collaborative uh, arrangements with uh, with the providers. And and I recognize competition, and I'm all for the, for competition, and uh, and the, and the marketplace uh, being uh, effective and efficient for the consumer. Um, but but where there's gaps in the marketplace, um, it, it sometimes is a, is an issue to try to deal with, and uh, and it, it becomes an immediate hurdle in people's minds um, that um, I think sometimes causes causes us to not move forward with different initiatives that could make a lot of sense for our communities. Thank you, Bruce. And you're right, we do have uh, a lot of conversations to be had. And, you know, at this point, we definitely, I feel like we have the support of our providers um, and all of them have been participating on, on all of our workshops and in all of our workshops and have had some great comments, but you're right, it does take a village. I mean, it, it really does take the collaboration of everyone to, to make it uh, expand and, and grow and for the benefit of, of everyone. So I, I hear you and I'm hoping that we can, we can maybe build on that um, would, going forward. Stacey, I would love to make a comment. Can you hear me? Yes. This is Commissioner Stephanie Madden from Lakeland, Florida. Um, I thought what Bruce said was really important because with the um, options, you know, for answers in this section, I think it is difficult because not to disparage the service providers who have given us the capacity and speeds that we have. We are so grateful for their innovation, for their business acumen that they've spent and risk capital to be able to invest in our markets so that we could have this valuable infrastructure. And so I think what happens is it seems like there's like, you know, this where does the infrastructure fall now? Because we kind of went from like the electrification of the country when it was just do I want a light bulb instead of a candle? Well, you know, then maybe a light bulb is a luxury. And maybe it should just be relegated to just businesses who have innovative ideas and if you can afford it, you can buy it. But then when electricity became uh, infrastructure for every single appliance that you can imagine, 
and that people could not even, you know, have a normal life without having electricity because everything was now being made and manufactured to be able to travel on that infrastructure, then maybe it's more like clean water. You know, maybe it's more of a necessity than a luxury and maybe then the government should get involved. And I think that whether you're, you know, wherever you fall on the political spectrum, we can all appreciate that the government is good at civil engineering and brings roads to your business, brings plumbing lines to your business, and then you just have to build the infrastructure within your building to connect to that greater infrastructure. And so I think part of what's happened is we have gone, you know, eclipsed the days of, you know, internet being a luxury item where I can, you know, to the point of watching Netflix or, or check my email, when it's my telehealth as an elderly person who can't, it doesn't have a vehicle to get to the doctor, I'm going to get a patient when we have COVID, and that's how I'm going to be able to participate with my classmates. So this past year has shown us that this is not just a luxury item anymore. This is absolutely critical infrastructure. Um, then when I say critical, you add to the safety concerns who owns the infrastructure, who's responsible to keep it safe. I'm sure that providers want to keep their infrastructure safe and, and have the, you know, the liability of hackers and cybersecurity threats to that infrastructure, but then also the governments have that responsibility and liability to keep that safe. So I think we're entering into a territory where, to, to Bruce Lyon's point, we have to all be at the table discussing this because it's not a fight. We're not on op opposing teams, government versus business. We actually all want the same thing. We want everyone to have ubiquitous coverage. We want everyone to have the speeds necessary to have a fruitful, beautiful life with the opportunities to go to school and to get the healthcare and to do the things that we need to do in, in our time. Um, and to do that, we have to figure out how can we have a stable infrastructure of fiber and then how do we have all of these other devices and innovations connect to them and who owns what. And I think that really is the big problem that needs to be solved. Thank you so much, uh, Commissioner Matt, and I appreciate that very much. And I do believe hey. we'll be able to, to talk about that a little bit more. Brad, would you like to comment? Yeah, yeah. I just I, I thought there was some great testimony uh, last week by providers in Tallahassee, and, and as we think about, you know, how power made it to every house, right? And then then they moved to the telephone. When the phone was considered not a luxury, you know, it took intense federal involvement, funding, et cetera, and it still took the United States 50 years to deploy that technology to every last household. And, and when you think about it, you know, the Internet, you know, has gotten where it is, to the commissioner's point, by, you know, the free market and competition. But when you think about, you know, the, the monopolies of power and, and the old monopolies of phone, you know, that was, you know, you could not get a certificate of occupancy without having power at your house. And it was mandatory hookup. So, you know, I, I think, you know, from, from an industry that, you know, uh, prides itself on, you know, competition and free markets, et cetera, you know, we, it, it is a challenge that we recognize as well as to, you know, how do we do this and, and how do we provide it? But, you know, where, whereas Europe took a, a governmental approach to the provision of Internet and they lagged the world, you know, well, the countries that were the government provided it, lagged, lagged the United States immensely. You know, the, the United States with its free market private sector approach, you know, built a strong enough network to then build, you know, the six largest companies on the planet, which are now Google, Facebook, et cetera. So, so you know, I think I think everybody's on to the same challenge here is is how do we get it to everybody, but how do we do it in a smarter way than than those monopolistic, you know, uh, prior models, and you know, and and how do you know private sector and government partners work together? So. It's great to hear everybody on the call, adding content, and um, you know, let's 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 work so that it doesn't take 50 years to get it to that you know last household to be made available, um, or or you know, at the very least, let let let's never make it a mandatory thing that somebody has to be able to afford this on top of their water and power before they can even make the option of of moving into a domicile. So, uh, thanks for all the good comments. Thank you, Brad. Anyone else have any other comments for us?
does our regional planning council have any other uh, comments or thoughts or anything that we need to add to the conversation? Uh, hey, Katie, thank you. I would just I would just like to thank everybody for coming today because it was a really, really good discussion. I just want you all to know we appreciate your time and we appreciate you actually joining the conversation. I think it was great. Thank you. I completely agree. I have one last uh, question in our poll and I have a pretty good idea what it's going to be. Uh, what the response is going to be. Would you like to opt in to future communications from the Florida Office of Broadband? That's typically a resounding yes, but it's okay if you don't want to as well. <laughs> but we'd love to uh, keep in touch with all of you. Um, I would like to thank uh, DEO leadership and everyone uh, here at DEO for, for helping us get these going. I want to thank the regional planning councils the Regional Councils Association, the Florida Association of Counties, Florida Internet and Television, Small Counties Coalition, and of course our internet providers for commenting today. Thank you all for, for participating and just such a healthy discussion of what we need to be doing and, what, and where we need to go. So I have learned a lot about your region today um, if there's, is there anyone else today that need, that has something else they'd like to, to comment on before we part ways? Okay, well, thank you so much. We will take all of this conversation um, into consideration and I look forward to hearing from all of you um, going forward and we will be in touch and hopefully we'll be able to have another one of these conversations in the very near future. So thanks so much for your participation today, everyone. Thank you, Katie. Thanks, Sean. Bye-bye.